Nine minutes. That's how much lead time the average American has when a tornado warning is issued. From the shrill shriek of their cell phone to the instant the twister strikes, precious minutes and seconds matter. 70 years ago, there were no tornado warnings. From roiling clouds would descend annihilative tornadoes unannounced. There was no way for a resident to know if an afternoon thunder shower contained a quick burst of rain or a funnel that would sweep away their neighborhood. Nowadays, meteorologists can often spot tornado weather a week or more in advance. They spend days zeroing in on targets, narrowing down their outlook areas over the course of days until a single thunderstorm incites their suspicions. Only then is a warning issued for residents to seek shelter. All advanced severe weather forecasts begin here, at the National Weather Service Storm Prediction Center in Norman, Oklahoma. 22 forecasters work around the clock. They peer as much as eight days into the future, working to sniff out looming threats and staying one step ahead of Mother Nature. Our outlooks go out through eight days. We are issuing hazard information um, for individual days out through eight days in advance. And it is difficult because the farther out in time you go, the more uncertainty there is. Elizabeth Lightman is a meteorologist at the Storm Prediction Center. You can often see her name at the bottom of convective outlooks. She's awake at all hours of the night combing through weather model data to look for setups that could spark severe storms. There is a, inherently just a lot of uncertainty. Um, however, uh, we have a lot of skill. Uh, we look at these things every day, all year long, um, and over time, you, you kind of build conceptual models for different patterns that are favorable for severe convection. Lightman's been at the Storm Prediction Center for more than 13 years. Like many forecasters, she spent the time assembling a mental encyclopedia of different weather patterns and severe weather events. Hey, I've seen this before and I know this is what happened and everything is telling me that, you know, this, this, this is it. I'm pretty confident. Forecasters like Lightman draw their first outlook maps as much as eight days before an event. The maps themselves aren't much to look at, just yellow and orange polygons that might as well be drawn in Microsoft Paint. But the true goldmine comes in the information forecasters like Lightman include in their highly technical yet nuanced forecast discussions down below. Making the forecast might mean starting as early as midnight, so it's ready for consumers when they wake up. Generally, those outlooks take about an hour and a half to do. As an event draws nearer, more model information becomes available, and meteorologists narrow down their zones of concern. In our outlooks, you may see much larger outlook areas that kind of, with time, as confidence increases, shrink down and kind of zero in on those areas where we're expecting the greatest severe potential once you get closer to, you know, day three, day two, day one. The day before is when forecasters start ironing out what the specific hazards will be. In addition to forecasting general severe thunderstorms, they highlight regions of the country prone to damaging winds, large hail, and yes, tornadoes. That day two outlook that I'm doing on those overnight extended outlook shifts probably takes me the longest. Those can take, depending on the weather, anywhere from an hour to two and a half hours to do. Then comes the day of. The day one period, we have we have five updates to that outlook, so it's not just one person. With so many forecasters, it's important to maintain consistency. That's where lead forecasters like Rich Thompson come in. I oversee all of the products. I don't issue all of them myself, but I'm kind of the safety net, quality control. Thompson's been at the helm for 30 years. In addition to double checking the work of others, he issues severe thunderstorm and tornado watches. Those are the large sprawling boxes that signify the need to stay weather aware on an active severe weather day. Thompson says that, a week out, only the positions and strengths of very large scale weather systems can be ascertained. These are weather systems on the size of the contiguous United States, something like that. When a new forecaster comes in, they inherit the outlook of the previous forecaster. Every meteorologist has their own tendencies and biases, but Thompson has come to learn everyone's strengths and weaknesses, including his own. We're well aware of each other's tendencies, and I try my best in cases where I suspect that it's the kind of forecast someone has struggled with in the past, or conversely, if it's the kind that I have struggled with, that we bring in somebody that we know has a different perspective on it as best we can. Thompson's goal is to keep the forecast on track methodically and strategically. We don't want the yo-yo effect where, you know, an area is in an outlook, it's out, it's in, it's out. So the, the battle for us is trying to be appropriately aggressive as far out as we can be, 
but at the same time not adding areas that we could easily take out the next day and then three days later we put it in somewhere else. In his career, Thompson has worked on 4,000 thunderstorm outlooks. A few stand out like the infamous morning update on April 27, 2011. On that day, he included a top tier high risk, issuing the most dire forecast in the history of the Storm Prediction Center. Hundreds across the Deep South would be dead by evening, with a total of 358 tornadoes touching down in the multi-day event. This is the time I had a lot of family members that lived across Mississippi and Alabama, so you know, there, it, it isn't just me putting out a forecast, it's me knowing that I've got close relatives that are in the uh, zone that's threatened to turn. I mean, people are gonna talk about this for generations, and it's just, it was amazing to see that firsthand, to do the forecast and then see the impact on everyone. This is probably one of the biggest tornado days of my career. In addition to severe thunderstorm and tornado watches, Thompson and his colleagues issue mesoscale discussions, or special bulletins on local regions where they deem something important to be happening. Well, a mesoscale discussion is a fancy name for a smaller scale forecast. So we're trying to outline areas, you know, typical two things that we're typically trying to do with mesoscale discussions. Number one would be to outline areas where we're considering a watch. On rare occasions, they'll even issue one for a specific storm while it's still producing a tornado. The most recent example that I've worked was the Mississippi tornadoes with uh, the EF4 at Rolling Fork. I put out that tornado watch and we did one of our, what we'd call a meso beta scale MD. This was prior to the formation of that supercell trying to say environmentally speaking and most of the guidance that we have, this is the corridor to worry about. It, that if something bad is gonna happen, it's almost certainly gonna have to evolve out of this small area of storms centered on Northeast Louisiana. And unfortunately, the Southern of those storms did evolve into the long track tornado producers. Once thunderstorms actually form, meteorologists issue warnings. Warnings are different from watches. Watches mean watch out. A warning means to take action. Those warnings, though, don't come from a centralized facility. Instead, they originate from one out of 122 different local National Weather Service offices nationwide. Jennifer Thompson is a meteorologist at the Norman, Oklahoma WFO, or Weather Forecast Office. During a big event, forecasters carefully dissect radar scans for hours on end. We use the um, all tilts and a whips. Sometimes we also use GR um, to kind of, we have a situational awareness display to kind of validate what we're thinking before we warn. Um, and usually warnings sometimes, especially for tornado warnings, they're not just one person who issue it. We kind of have an internal discussion on what we're seeing and, and how we should classify it and that sort of thing. When it comes to issuing a tornado warning, seconds count. When we see something coming, we'll draw up the polygon beforehand before we're ready to issue it. And then once we're ready to hit it, we'll make sure we select, you know, the winds, the hail sizes, any calls to action that we want to include. And then, yeah, at that point, once we're ready, okay, yeah, it's severe or yeah, it's tornado now, then we'll click submit and it's out. Issuing a warning may only take moments, but it's that instantaneous decision making that forecasters are trained for throughout their entire career. Pulling the trigger might mean waking up an entire city in the dead of night. And if you do it, you'd better hope you're right. Well, you gotta kind of practice some quick mindfulness, you know, take some calming breaths because you, you have to kind of clear your head and reset, sort of, um, and, and just kind of focus on what you're here to do. Even when a forecaster does everything right, the aftermath of some events remains etched in their mind. The tornado warning in Roger Mills County on February 26th because that was the one that, where we had the fatality. Um, but that was my first, also, fatality So from a warning. So that was probably the most memorable and one I carry with me, so. During big events, local weather forecast offices work as staff up in advance. Uh, if we may have 10 people in the office. Each of those 10 people has a job to do. Uh, it may be we have three warning forecasters and they're each doing an assigned area of, the, of our county warning area. Rick Smith is a warning coordination meteorologist in Norman and also specializes in public outreach. He's in charge of tackling warning strategy. Uh, you've got a job to do and your job could impact the lives of thousands of people, you know, but at the same time you're worried about uh, those people. You're worried about what's going to happen. You, you're hoping 
you know, you're hoping that all that work we've done in the days and hours and minutes leading up will pay off and that people will do what they need to do to be safe. During a big event, meteorologists might remain glued to their radar displays for hours on end, all while taking in information from dozens of other sources. It's an exercise in discipline and extreme concentration. Any chaos or any excitement is more in our heads because as we're anticipating and worried about all the things that are that, that could happen or that are, that are happening right now. Uh, but it, it's, it's a calm environment, it's a professional environment. Good morning, National Weather Service Norman. Phones are ringing constantly. We're getting alerts on our workstations for different things. We're monitoring local media coverage. We're getting information from local amateur radio operators, storm spotters. There's a lot of activity, but it's organized and, and generally it's pretty, pretty reserved, pretty quiet, pretty professional. Nowadays, tornado warnings are disseminated directly to cell phones through automatic wireless emergency alerts. Those help reach populations that before might not always have been tuned in and paying attention. You know, we're not able to come tap you on the shoulder and tell you a tornado's coming. Those wireless emergency alerts, we're tapping a, a smaller group of people on the shoulder. So it is, it is letting us reach a group of people who may not even know the National Weather Service exists. Tornado casualties have been steadily declining throughout the years. And while tragedies do occasionally still happen, many more are averted thanks to the work of meteorologists everywhere. A warning truly does save lives. It's not just hyperbole. It's not just, uh, you know, something we put on a mission statement. In the end, however, meteorologists themselves aren't immune to the weather they forecast. Living in Oklahoma, meteorologists like Smith know they're just as vulnerable too. As a meteorologist, you've been watching it, but you're, you're as helpless as anybody else at that point. On May 6, 2015, we had a, an EF1 tornado that uh, damaged my home. We actually had more damage two days later, May 8th, when we had a big hailstorm come through. He says he's replaced four roofs during his time there, but nothing will ever get in the way of his mission. We know what we're getting into when, when we come here. It's, it's, it's our job, it's what we do. You always hear that it's different when you see it in person, and it's, it's true. I mean, it's seeing how people are affected. You know, I saw someone just walking out of a neighborhood with a suitcase asking where he could get an Uber out because, you know, roads were shut off to his neighborhood so he can get, get out. Um, so, yeah, it, how it impacts people is very, you know, eye-opening. Follow My Radar on social media Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and YouTube. Download My Radar on iOS, Android, Amazon Alexa, Xbox, and Windows.